Well, um, we're here with uh, Tommy Shalami, and I want to start off, Tommy, by asking you, with um, Manhattan, it's got a very different feel, a very unique feel to a lot of the other shows you've worked on in the past. Um, and how how did you come to work on this show? And I guess how do you uh, like what vision did you bring into sort of trying to create the look of the show? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> first of all, I do think there's some similarities between this show and some of the other shows that I've done a little bit. But you know, every show, if, especially if I'm doing the pilot and I'm sort of helping design and create the sort of feel of the show, uh, you know, it's the material that drives that. It's not, oh, I have an idea, I'd love to do a show that looks like this or like that. It's completely driven by this piece of material. And I got this script as a writing sample, actually. Uh, and uh, one of the producers on the show, who also runs my company, Julie DeJoy, read it and came running into my office and said, you got to read this immediately. And it was far more than a writing sample to me. It was really a brilliant script and one in which I immediately wanted to get involved in. Uh, so then we developed it slightly together, but Sam had been developing it for five years before that. Uh, and I think for Sam it was, how do we take what I've written here and bring that thing to life? And it was an incredible challenge. Uh, and the biggest reason was, it's not necessarily a show about the scientist. It's not just a show about family life or the community. It's a show about all of those things. So that's a big palette and a big world that you have to kind of create. It was also a show that the world itself didn't exist uh, until Los Alamos, until they started to build the bomb. So it was sort of like the Old West. And I think the driving force for me in the sort of visual palette of the show was I knew I wanted to shoot it practically. I knew I wanted to shoot a show that felt real, that felt that you were in as transported into this world as were these sort of brilliant men and women who lived a very protected academic life that were sort of lifted up and thrown into the middle of the New Mexico desert. That's kind of what we're doing with our actors, sort of picking them up from LA and New York and throwing them in the desert. And if that was an element of the show, if that had a sort of a visual motif, then I thought everything else would sort of lead. And the other thing that was important Two other things was it was a world in transition, uh, so much like and the and the sort of stepping off stone for me is Robert Altman's McCabe and Miss Miller, because I remember seeing that movie thinking, oh that's probably what the rest West really looked like, do you know? Not oh it had perfect boardwalks and it had little nice you know it, when it rained it was just muddy and dirty and people didn't bathe all the time and. Uh, so there was an element of that that I wanted for the show because they're at Los Alamos or the Hill as it was known at that time. There were no sidewalks, there were no addresses. And the other thing was a sense of containment, that this was a prisoner of war camp in truth, that they could not leave on their own wishes. And so both containment, uh, transition, and being practical is what led to the sort of visual uh, palette of the show. Mm. And I guess with the uh, like with this, show, just like the Manhattan Project, where they had to build their own town to sort of run this thing, you guys have sort of built your own town in New Mexico as well. Um, hopefully, you let the actors leave when um, when they want to get out of town and stuff. Don't be too sure of that. Don't be too sure. <laughs> They're held up in there. Um, what? Like, but um, what is what is the big challenge with sort of shooting in New Mexico and sort of that whole operation rather than just a soundstage in in uh, Burbank or something? What was the challenge? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, look, I think um, the challenge were was, and I, I mean this was the opportunities. Do you know uh, that the challenge is the weather here? That when you do a show. Uh, and especially that's why the studio was nervous. You know, you mostly would want to do a show where you have cover, which means a place to go when it becomes bad weather. Uh, and therefore, you would be on a stage, and, you know, you could go out a few days, but mostly be on the stage. We were sort of saying, we don't need a stage. We're going to shoot this all practically. And therefore, the challenge was adapting to the conditions that were you know, in front of us, which was the weather. 
those also became part of the excitement of the show. And one of the reasons I think the show feels the way it feels was I remember, for instance, I think we were shooting the first or second episode, and it was with Rachel, who plays Abby. Uh, and it was one of her very first scenes, and we're outside of her house. And the way it does in New Mexico is beautiful and gorgeous. And about 15 minutes later, it was about 30 mile an hour winds, and that dust was blowing everywhere. And you know, I could tell as an actress, you know, she was spitting out dust. She was trying to squint her eyes. She didn't think this would be the most attractive way to meet this character. And I came running up to her and I went, this is sensational. This is exactly what I was hoping for. And it was. It was like she didn't have to do the preparation of, okay, I'm new in this play. She was overwhelmed by it. And she's such a brilliant actress. She just used all of that. And and the camera people used it, and, you know, they weren't going, oh, my God, it's too much wind. Look at the lights there. We just went with it. And when it rained, we went with it. And so those problems became the solutions to what I believe is uh, a visual look to the show that isn't easily duplicated. I'm glad you're talking about some of the actors, because I wanted to ask you about that. You, you've done so many TV shows, and when you're developing a show like this one, Casting is so important, and like most of them, you know, you've got a mix of Broadway people, movie people, some well-known, some first, you know, people that we didn't know at all. How do you know when you're sitting in a session and you're talking to some actors? How do you know that they're the right ones? Well, I would like to give you a, a really clear answer of that and look like I'm incredibly bright, but anyone else who does it would go, God, that guy's full of shit. Uh, the truth of it is. I have a theory of casting, uh, especially big ensemble pieces, and I think of it as symphonies. I think of it as the way you would put together a symphony. And you put together a symphony is that you have woodwinds and you have brass and that you have strings and that you have people that play different instruments. And for me, that becomes a really important part. So once you start casting, it affects who else you cast and how you do it, as opposed to you're just casting in a vacuum and casting nine actors and hope, let's see what happens afterwards. So there is a feeling of, you know, each actor brings something incredibly unique that the other actor doesn't. And, you know, it's that thing that happens sometimes you think, well, maybe they're, they should read for the other character. Or, you know, in the middle of a session, you'll ask somebody, read for the other character. You're better for that character at this point. And that might have something to do with who you've already cast. So that's one thing for me. The other thing, which is, I honestly believe it's a needle in a haystack, you know, when you find not only the talent that I think is on this show, and I have been very lucky. I mean, I think, you know, I think about the ensemble that I was part of putting together in Parenthood and the one that we had on West Wing. And, the, you know, I've just been really incredibly fortunate, to be quite honest with you, uh, because the thing you don't know, no matter how well you've done the casting, is how they'll, what the alchemy of that group is when you put them all together, what happens? And there's a form in the way that I sort of rehearse pilots, you know, I don't really do scene study. I end up, we all eat together, we spend as much time together, we learn each other's habits and try to get to know each other a little bit better than just, let's do this scene, let's get your backstory and let's figure that out so that people start to get connected in a rhythm because in many cases they've already been together for two years by the time you start the pilot or they elected a president already, so they've been in the war room, and now you're starting day one, they better know each other a little bit. And that's what you don't know for sure. Uh, now you have some instincts after doing it long enough that this person seems like somebody that would be able to work with others well, you know, because I think it's fairly important for most of the characters as you're putting it together. And I think what became so clear, and I'm telling you within 24 hours of the first rehearsal, that this group of people really liked one another. Uh, and I'm telling you, it makes everyone's job, uh, and, and most importantly, the result of what you see on screen. It's a tangible difference. It's an absolute tangible difference. Uh, now, you don't know what it would have been like if they didn't get along, the show might be just as good, And but I don't think so. I think that had an, an incredibly powerful element to it, that Ash and Rachel, uh, became friendly. Something happened in Rachel's life at that moment. She had appendicitis. And she had to call somebody in the middle of the night. And she called Ash, who 
was her fictitious husband, you know, who had to help her before we even started shooting. They had a connection with one another. So I just think it's it's incredibly important. And this was a, as talented as they are is also how decent they all are as as human beings. It's kind of unbelievable. Mm. I, I sort of found like as impressive as the cast you assembled was the crew of directors you've assembled like for the show from like Chris Miss to Paris Barclay to Bill Biela and things like and Anatias and things like that. Between you you've got 20 directing nominations at the Emmys, you've got six wins and I'm not even counting all the drama series wins and nominations you guys have got. How is like bringing a team of directors like that together as well to sort of, you know, sort of you run with the ball for the first two episodes, then you pass off to someone else? Like, how does that all work and what was that like? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, look, uh, you're right. It's unbelievable the sort of list of directors that we got the first year. Now, some of that is, you know, I've been doing it a long time and so have a lot of those other directors, and we're all sort of supportive of each other. Uh, I would like to say it was those personal relationships, but if this script was not interesting, if this was not a provocative piece of filmmaking, uh, they would have all gone, God, Tommy, I, I'd love to work with you. I'm just not quite available this time. Uh, so I think it was a combination, but I think what drove this was they read, everybody read those first two episodes, which had already been written, and they realized that we would get on the phone. I would sort of tell them... Uh, the sort of way that I sort of see the show. Many of them I had worked with before, uh, so they also knew that they're coming to a show and being treated as the director of that show, not as the director who should do what the pilot director did, or what the executive producers want, that we were looking. And, the, and they helped shape this show. I mean, and it, you didn't mention Dan Adias and Mike Uppendahl and Rosemary Rodriguez and Julianne Robinson. and I mean, it was an incredible group of people. Uh, and, and actually, Danny Stern, who did an amazing job uh, also. But, you know, um, I, I just think that uh, the material is what got it. I also think a first-year show, you know, I mean, we're lucky. We're, a lot of those people are coming back for this, this year, do you know? Uh, which was really very gratifying. Everybody sort of called me. In fact, you know, we're doing 10 episodes instead of 13, so I couldn't bring everybody back. And I did want to find some new people to bring in, but everybody wanted to do it again. Uh, it's hard work, but it's really gratifying work. And they're, you know, the level of what they brought to the show, and they knew, especially in the first year, they knew they were being asked, you find something, you bring something of yourself to the show, to keep making this show what it will become. And that's why I think the last episodes, the best, I mean, the, the show just got, kept getting better and better, and everybody added on to that as we went. Well, I'm glad Matt brought up Emmys. You've got nine of them uh, uh, in your house, and several of them have come, you know, on those first seasons. I have more than nine before. of them in my house, because my wife lives in that house, too. And that she has well, that's been, true. And an Oscar. <laughs> Yes, that's right, which she says um, equals my other eight Emmys, just saying. <laughs> well, several of yours have come on the on the first season of a show, like like Manhattan has uh, just finished mm -hmm. up its first season. How important is that to get that recognition for a show in that first season, whether it's Emmys or Guild Awards or real recognition across the board, just to, just to put the show on the map? Well, I think it's massively important. I mean, and I think it's even more important right now than it was when we were doing West Wing. Uh, you know, there's so many incredible shows. And it's, it, it really is kind of stunning. And, and, and so if you can sort of critically break through, if you can sort of people can recognize that not it's better than all the other shows, but at least you can hang a lantern on the idea that it, uh, there's a critical mass that is recognizing this. And look, you know, Tastemakers do make shows, you know, the shows that don't have a big audience but has a core audience that gets the word out can, you know, build a show. And so, truthfully, it's incredibly important. The other thing is a good pat on the back never hurts, you know, uh, that I think it helps people. It recognizes a show for all of us. So, for instance, when John Lindley, who was the person who shot the first four episodes, who did the beginning of our show, our cinematographer, this year won the ASC award for best cinematography. 
it wasn't that, oh my God, see, now we've won an award. I guess we're good. It was just so exciting for all of us that in this enormous, you know, uh, field of really ex extraordinary television, someone recognized our work and saw what we're doing. And so, you know, yes, the win, it would be extraordinary, but the, to be nominated in that world is recognizing, especially a small show, a show that didn't have a massive viewership, that didn't get the sort of uh, 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 commercial recognition that I still believe this show eventually will get because I think it that it's so honestly the show is an incredibly contemporary show to me. It's you know I, I think about the deal that just happened today with Iran, and now that whole deal is about how to stop somebody from building a bomb. Uh, and so where did that start? That started in the desert. So we're the origin story, not a story about the end of World War II, which is how we sort of see it. But anyway, uh, doing this interview, which is why we so appreciate that you do this and that, that they're out there and that, uh, but uh, I, it would be incredibly disingenuous to go, ah, oh, you know, Emmys are nice, they're fun, they're okay. I think they're so meaningful to a show and not to the person per se, you know, it's nice for people to get recognized, but I'm much more interested in the show getting recognized, you know, which is why I always thought the greatest award ever in anything was the SAG Ensemble Award, because it always felt like, oh, that's a whole group of people that are saying, all of you are really great. And I just remember when we won on West Wing, it was the most exciting award, you know, uh, because you felt like a group was being recognized, you know, for their work. Well, Matt, uh, talking about Emmys, he uncovered, uh, I thought, a really interesting fact about your career. You may or may not be aware of it. What was it, Matt? Uh, is that you're, I think, one of only three people to have won an Emmy Award for directing a comedy series and directing a drama series. Um, the other two are Paul Bogart and Gregory Holbert. Uh, what, like, what does it mean to like have accomplished something like that? And I guess to have won drama series directing two years in a row... No one's won that award twice since you have as well. Well, uh, I, I knew about, I didn't know how, how, I knew it was a select group of the comedy drama. Do you know, I didn't know about the two back to back, but, uh, you know, uh, here's the deal. I, I honestly think I, I, I'm lucky enough that, I'll tell you very quickly, when I first started my career, I would do comedies, and I remember the producers huddled in the corner and go, be careful, he's going to make it a little too dramatic. And then I would go do a drama, and those producers would be huddled in the corner and going, be careful, he might make this a little too comedic. Uh, and I actually think it's part of the way I see the world, and I think as television grows up, that I could do a show like Sports Night, that you could have this incredible level of comedy in it, and at any moment it could turn, which is the way I sort of wake up in the morning thinking. I've never woken up thinking it's a half-hour comedy day. Uh, or it's an hour drama day. It's just this combination. So I, I, part of it is I feel lucky. I think it would have been harder to do 25 or 30 years ago that I did an episode of, you know, Barney Miller and then an episode of Hill Street. Um, and I'm not sure it was easy. They, they kind of segued together a little bit for me. Uh, so that's part of it, you know. But, you know, look, I, the fact that I won one Emmy, the fact that I got recognized and nominated is way past – the, what I imagined when I was 16 or 17 years old. So I'm deeply appreciate, appreciative of it um, and, and proud of it, really proud of it. Well, one last mm. directing question. I know you're, you're prepping the second season of Manhattan. By the way, uh, real quick so people know, what's the timeline? Like what, you're about to start shooting season two, and when will that be out? The timeline is we will start April 15th. So I start... And, you know, there's X's on a calendar right here in front of me, so I think it's something like 15, 16 days, not sure. Uh, and we don't have an uh, exact date. It will be either the last week in September or the first week in October that we will launch. WGN is still sort of figuring out a couple of things. Uh, and, uh, and then we will run 10 straight episodes from that point. Well, the, the directing question I had was, you probably know, I mean, I know you've noticed this, the last five or six years in television just seem like uh, like we're in the new golden age of television, and you've seen so many feature film directors, you know, do pilots or be executive producers, David Fincher, Steven Soderbergh, Martin Scorsese. As you being somebody that works mainly in television, what, what have you felt like the last five or six years seeing so many of those accomplished people 
taking on television, and why do you think that's attractive to them right now? Well, I think you could say the absolute reverse, too. You could go, oh, look, J.J. Abrams and Alan Taylor, and, oh, look, they're making movies now. They were making television. And I think the answer to that is we're all making cinematic art, and that's what I really believe has happened. I think that the TV sets have gotten bigger and bigger, and the movie screens have gotten smaller and smaller. They're starting to – there's no vocabulary that I can use, that I can't use, telling the story of Manhattan that I wouldn't be using if I was shooting – the movie of Manhattan. Do you know, I might have more time and more money. Maybe not, by the way. There's so many independent films that that might not be true either. But I think what's most important is, as directors now, I think that line, you know, I'm proud to call myself a television director. I have no, I'm running from that, and I'm very proud of it. But I do think in 10 years, there won't be, are you a television director or you, you make movies? I, I just think, it's why USC changed their, that used to be USC Film School, it's USC School of Cinematic Arts. They understand that there is no separation anymore. There really isn't. And so those people crossing into the world, I mean, I remember, and it was about five or six or seven years ago, I would go to any producer and I'd have a meeting about possibly a movie that they were maybe interested, I had read the script, and inevitably it was the producer asking me so how do you get into television how if I wanted to get into television you know it was like you could feel this wave very different than ever before of where can I best tell the stories I want to tell and shoot the film that I want to shoot and I think that's just as possible for Steven to do the Nick and to shoot everything that he's ever wanted to shoot and do that as it is for Alan Taylor to go and do the new Terminator movie because of his work on Game of Thrones and his work on West Wing and his work on other HBO shows. So I just think the cross fertilization is is where it's it's a done deal. It's no longer uh, you know what, I have a little bit of time. I'm a movie director. I think I'll try a pilot, you know. I think they realize they get involved in it. Gus Van Zant will go do you know, they just get involved in it and they realize I'm getting to tell a story. This isn't you know, ten years ago you'd always read the article. Movie director does pilot. And they really did, honestly, most of them were like, I can get paid, I can do it between a movie, and that's it. That's not what's sort of going on now at all. So including with Marty, you know, who is very committed when he started Boardwalk of making sure that show felt the way he wanted that show to feel, and now this new show that he's doing. So, Yeah, and it's Marty. so interesting, like, that evolution of, like, TV in 15 years because sort of um, the West Wing that you were on was – Probably the last network drama, like that, dominated the Emmys. Like you did with four drama series wins in a row, twenty six right. wins. Like you know, like last twenty four, they did quite well a couple of years after for certain years. But you were the last network show that really ran the table at the Emmys and dominated um, them before these cable and other network basic cable streaming cable took over. But there's so many sort of iconic scenes from the West Wing that you were able to direct from that opening walk and talk to the rant in the cathedral with Martin Sheen to the getting the band back together and the shooting and the Bartlett for American Napkin. Is there one moment from that show that like just sticks out to you as what a great accomplishment, like sort of at the end of that network TV era in some ways? Uh you mean in relationship to it being network television or just in relationship to West Wing? Just in relationship to West Wing and, yeah. and your directorial achievements. You know, look, I, again, it's it, it's a little bit like you know, I have three children and, you know, yeah. honestly, which one do you like the best? Uh, do you know? Uh, but, uh, you know, I, honestly, there, there's just so many moments in that show uh, that – feel, you know, I, I've told this before, you know, when I think about the show, I think about the tiniest moments, a little moment that we found a little nugget of performance that, you know, John and uh, Martin might be in a scene together, and there was no visual dynamics, there was nothing kind of extraordinary that was sort of happening. Uh, the, you know, um, it just was, you know, working with that group of people, you know. So part of the memory of all of that always, when I even, you know, occasionally will see some of the show or see a clip, I'll remember that day. I'll remember that afternoon. It's a little bit like an athlete who remembers, you know, I remember the count was three and two, and I looked in the bench and I saw somebody. 
you just sort of remember the personal moments. I will tell you a shot in the, which I've never said. I've just thought about this. There's a shot in West Wing that I did that is not an amazing shot, but I always felt like it highlighted how everything sort of fell into place for us on that show. That the, how it hit the zeitgeist, that group of people coming together, the fact that you know. Uh, America was, uh, you know, accepting of this sort of Valentine's to public service. I think it's the end of season two. Seems like Matt, you might know this better than me, but uh, uh, it's the thing where, when the if he puts his hands in his pockets, uh, you know, then we'll know that he's going to run again. Uh, that that's when he's thinking and he's making a decision. It's the flashback. It's. Uh, uh, and it's uh, John Spencer says, watch this. And the shot is over Martin, drenched wet. And the camera comes around and finds, you know, his hands in his pocket, you know. Uh, uh, or you see his hand go into his pocket and then on his face about to say it. And as we come around, I had forced. And I remember actually Chris Smith, you mentioned, who used to be a grip, was a director who was also shooting another little piece while we were in Washington. And he said, Tommy you're making grips go out in the rain out there, these rain towers, and put this big pole so there could be an American flag out a window that you're never going to see. And I went, I, I know, but I'm telling you, uh, I, I have a feeling. And that camera came around, and as it hit him, there was a gust of wind. And if you look at that shot, the flag just waves. It's, you know, pretty far away and outside and through a window. But it completely frames the shot. And I've always thought... That's how lucky we were on that show. Uh, that shot was lucky. I mean, I, I can tell you I wanted a flag out there, but I didn't go. And I want the flag to wave right as we get there. I mean, there wasn't a wind machine that made it do that. It just happened. And it just felt like uh, a lot of that show, there was so much of that show that just fell into place with great design and hard work. But we were very, very lucky, too. Hmm. Well, well, like Ian, like happened. the lightning. And, yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly right. The lightning we designed. But it's, yeah. Was, it's like, yeah. Mm. Chris? Well, Matt, go ahead and wrap up. We, we, we just wish yeah. you so much luck with Manhattan at the Emmys and all the different um, critics awards this summer and so forth. And hopefully uh, they'll recognize the, the quality work you've got going on there. Well, we really hope. And this helps us. And we really appreciate both of you guys, you know, interviewing any of us that we can and whatever we can do to help let us know. Well, we're going to interview a lot of your folks, and if folks haven't watched our interview with Sam Shaw, the creator, and, and uh, John Benjamin Hickey already, they're in our Emmy Contenders folder. And, and uh, good luck on this season. I, I, I said, look, it's going to be a fun one. It's a really interesting season that has a very dramatic ending. Uh, so it, it'll, it, it's really interesting. Um, so it's great. Thank you so much, guys.